Thank you for choosing to listen to today's message by Reverend Dr. David Entry. We know you will be blessed as you seek and serve God. We believe that this message will stir up a desire for more of God, even as you listen. Be blessed. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. We thank God for today. And we certainly thank God for the gift of life. Life is not a right. Life is a gift. Life is not a right. Life is a gift. And if we are here today and we are alive, it's not because we are better than those who are not around, but it's just because God has helped us and we have received the gift of life. And we want to be grateful to God. And I thank God actually for our lives and the privilege to actually hear his word and share his word. And it's even a greater privilege for me to be appointed by God to bring the word of God, the word of life, the word of truth, the word of grace, and certainly the word of faith to you. I pray, it's my prayer, that as this word comes, your, may, your, may your heart be strangely warmed. May, may your heart burn, may our hearts burn within us. May scales fall off our eyes. May illumination be granted us. May the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the, be granted us in the knowledge of him that we will behold wondrous things and amazing things in his word. I pray that as this word comes, it will be a head, a, a word of healing, healing for you. It's be, it will be a word of direction for somebody. It will bring the rhema word of God to somebody. It will be the word of insight and illumination. It will be the word of freedom and liberty. And it will be the word above all, the word of salvation in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege to hear the word of life. We pray that as we hear your word that brings life, the word that is living, which is active, sharper than any two-edged sword, let this living word, let this word of life, let this active word stir up revival in our hearts. Let, let it bring to bear your wisdom, your purpose, your program, your plan, your agenda, and, and what you are doing in our lives and in our times to us in the name of Jesus. We rebuke the devourer. We rebuke the thief that comes to steal the word. We rebuke the plan of the enemy to block people from hearing your word. And we pray that give us a sanctified ear. Give us sanctified ears. Give us circumcised ears. Give us opened ears that we will hear with from our hearts your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. As you can tell, I'm talking about the uh, how or what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? Salvation is a very important thing about life because life is risky. Life is short. In James chapter 4, verse 14, he said, what is your life? It appears today and tomorrow is like a, uh, like a vapor is gone. One of the one translation says that it is like a steam that is coming out of a boiling pot. So it's like a steam. It, it comes up and it's gone. It comes up and disappears into thin air and disappears into nothing. There are people who live once upon a time. Now life is going on without them because what? They came and they are gone. Everybody comes and goes. We are here and we will go. So it's always important to think about the bigger picture of life. Life is not all there is to life is not all that we see or what there is to life is not all that we see there is more in other words there is more to life than we see or we know or we experience here on earth life is more than we can experience now so it's always important to pause and to think the purpose about the purpose of life, the direction of your life, the reason for your life, and the focus of your life. So he says that what is your life? What is your life? What is it about? Some even go to a stand of saying that life is nothing. You just come and you let us eat and drink. Tomorrow we die. In First Corinthians chapter 15, I think from within the mid 30s, 35 or somewhere, he said, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Because there's no, there's no life after this. That's all. And some will also say that you go and you come back like maybe an ant or like a tiger or a lion or an elephant or something or like a prince or a king. When you go, you are not coming back, please. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 is appointed unto man once to die and after that judgment. So it's not uh, uh, to die and come back. No, 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 no. You are not coming back. So then L, you have whatever you have to do, 
do it now because tomorrow the grave you, you are going Everybody's heading towards the grave. And where you go, there's no labor. There's no work. So any work you have to do, it has to be done now. What must I do to be saved? What must I do? They came to John the Baptist when he was baptizing. And they asked him, John, teacher, they asked him, what shall we do? It's always a question people who ask or people who think thinkers. If you think a little bit about life, you will, you will invariably ask this question. What is this? What is life about? What is life about? And what must I do about life? John chapter, sorry, Luke chapter 3, verse 10, verse 12, and verse 14. And the people ask him, saying, What shall we do? <laughs> verse, verse 12. Then came also publicans to be baptized and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? Verse 14. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said of them. So it's a, it is an age-old question for thinkers. When you come into contact or in, when you are faced with the realities of life, it will all, this question will always come. What shall we do? What must we do? In Acts chapter 22 verse 10, Saul, Paul the apostle, when he met Jesus Christ, he, that, that's the question he asked. Acts chapter 22 verse um, verse 10, Acts 22 verse 10 says this, it says that, and I said, what shall I do, Lord? And he said unto me, blah, blah, blah. What shall I do, Lord? He said, it's, a, it's an age old question for thinkers who realize that there's more to life. You ask, what shall I do? It's not just about fun. It's not just about fight. It's not just about earning. It's not just about gaining. It's not just about um, being seen or appearing a certain way. There is more to life than it appears to the eye. So what? Thinkers will always ask, what shall I do? This man came into contact with reality, life and death. He was in a life and death situation. And in Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas, they said to him, don't harm yourself. For we are all here. We are alive. We are not dead. Don't harm yourself because if the prisoners escape, if the prisoners escape, that means that he will, he will give his life for that. And he couldn't stand the torture. So he decided to take his own life. They said, don't harm yourself. For we are here. We have not escaped. Then in verse 30, Acts 16, 30, he said to them, says, what must I do to be saved? When you are faced with life and death situation, when you are faced with the reality of life, one of the things that will come to your mind and to your heart, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? He said, says, what shall I do to be saved? When they came to Jesus Christ in John chapter 6, the disciples, people, after he taught a very powerful message and uh, no, after he multiplied the bread and him crossed to the other side, the disciples came and then they asked him, Lord, Acts, sorry, John 6, 28 says that. Then they said unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? What shall we do? What shall we do? What shall we do? It's a very important question. What shall we do? And do you know the response of Jesus? Um, verse 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, the work of God is that you believe on him whom he sent. The work of God is that you believe on him whom he sent. What must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? Another way I would like to put it is, how did you end up in church? Or how do you become part of church? How do I enter church? How do I become part of the redeemed? How do, I, how do I become a redeemed soul? Another way to put salvation, what shall I be, do to be saved, is salvation is another way to make, put salvation is forgiveness of sins. So how do you become part of the forgiven? Those who are saved are the forgiven. Those who are saved are the redeemed. Those who are saved are those who have been reconciled. Reconciliation. Those who are saved are those, are those who have been justified. Those who are saved are those who have been regenerated. These are all same words that mean the same thing. Saved. Redeemed. 
forgiven, uh, forgiven, saved, redeemed, forgiven, justified, reconciled. Hallelujah! How do I get saved? In fact, it talks about who has redeemed us from the powers, delivered us from the powers of darkness. He said, for Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the Lord. What does it mean to be redeemed? Redeem, redeemed, to be redeemed, or to redeem means something that belongs to you that you lost or it's on the market now and you have to go and redeem it. So you, you were, maybe you had up and you sold your shoe and then now you have money, but you need that shoe. So you have to go and buy, pay and redeem the shoe. So for us to be redeemed, it means that a price has to be paid. That, that's why um, Bible talks about, in fact, before a price to be paid, you must be sold. You must be for, sorry, you must be for sale in order to be redeemed. First of all, to be redeemed means you have been sold away and now you have been, a price has to be paid for you to be purchased back. When were we sold? Bible talks about Romans chapter 7 verse 5. I am, uh, the law is holy, the law is perfect, but I am a, a sinner, sold and uh, under sin. Or I have been sold. We are sold. It's not like you are for sale if you are not in Christ. You have already been sold. And Bible says, Jesus, this is how Jesus put his role. Romans chapter, sorry, John chapter 8, verse 34. It says that you, uh, you are a slave to sin. Spoke, Jesus spoke about being a slave to sin. I think I opened it somewhere. Yeah, it's here. Being a slave to sin. John chapter 8, verse 34. Jesus, this is how Jesus put it. It's very interesting. And Jesus answered, most assuredly I say unto you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. Slave to sin. Slave to sin. Sold. That's why he says that he who the son sets free is free indeed. So we have been sold to sin and Jesus had to pay the price to purchase us, to redeem us. So the Roman Acts chapter 20 verse 28, he said, take it to the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. What did he use to buy us, to purchase us? His own blood. So he bought us. That means we have been redeemed. So what must I do to be redeemed, to be part of this redeemed community? What must I do to be reconciled? And I like this, First Corinthians chapter, Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. It says, to which that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. God's, God was in Christ. What was he doing in Christ? Reconciling the word to himself, the world, sorry, to himself. So then there is enmity. There is enmity between God or between us and God. There was between us and God or humanity and God because of the treason Adam and Eve committed or because of Adam and Eve's sin. All of us have been uh, uh, have been sold under sin. All of us have sinned and fallen short, uh, fallen short of the glory of God. But God in Christ was what has been doing. What has God been doing? He reconciling the world. Reconc not only people who are born again, not only people who are Christians, not only people who know about Him. Anybody, he, God was busy reconciling the world to himself in Christ Jesus reconciling those of us who have been reconciled to himself those this that's how it, 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 the, the the word for it is we have been saved it means we have been redeemed so a redeemed person is someone who has been reconciled or who has had reconciliation with God now our friendship has been restored hallelujah reconciliation to God saved redeemed and we have been justified by says that be, Romans chapter 3 being justified verse 24 being freely justified by faith or by grace which is through Christ Jesus Romans chapter 3 thank you Holy Spirit praise God Romans chapter 3 verse 24 it says that being justified freely by his grace through the redemption we see we are redeemed we are redeemed so it's all once you are redeemed you are justified once you are justified you are redeemed you are sanctified uh, once you are redeemed you are justified once you are justified you are reconciled once you are reconciled you are regenerated all these words mean the same thing that actually means you are saved so watch this he says that being justified freely by the grace through the by his grace through the redemption that is in that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. So we get it through his blood. 
first uh, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 we have been forgiven in whom we have redemption through his blood Colossians 1 14 same thing we have redemption through his blood hallelujah so we are redeemed we are so to be saved or to have salvation means that we have redemption means we have reconciliation we, we it means we uh, um, we have justification we have been justified in other words we are just to stand before God that's why I said the just shall live by faith the the fact that um, Galatians chapter 3 verse 11 said that no flesh is justified by the law by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified before God. It's the same then Romans chapter, I think Romans chapter 3 verse 21 or so. By the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. So we are justified for the just shall live by faith. So we bring faith to the table, faith in Christ Jesus, and then we are justified. So coming back to the point, saved, to be saved, what does it mean to be saved? It means to be justified. It means to be reconciled. It means to be uh, regenerated. It means to be uh, to be justified, to be reconciled, to be regenerated. It means to be, I like this one, redeemed. Hallelujah. But above all, it means to have life, to receive life. What is what kind of life? Everlasting life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Bible says that for God has given us eternal life, 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 and 12. And this life is in his son, Jesus Christ. So he has given us eternal life. What is the difference between eternal life and everlasting life? It's the same life of God, okay? It's called Zoe, the life of God. But so what is the difference between eternal life? It, everlasting life is in, the, in, in terms of time, endless. It's talking about duration. It's everlasting time. But the everlasting life, the eternal life, is talking about the divine life. So the, the nature of God, the life of God, the Zoe itself if is everlasting in nature. It's, it's, we have it throughout. It stays with us, the everlasting life, the eternal life. We have eternal life. So watch this. It takes life to be saved. When the life of Christ comes into you, you are saved. You are regenerated according to 1 Peter Sorry, according to Titus chapter 3, verse 5, being saved not by uh, the works of the law which we have done or our own works of righteousness, but we have been saved through the, re, uh, the, the regeneration of the Spirit. So we are saved through grace by the regeneration of the Spirit. We have been regenerated. So the life that God gives us actually regenerates us. But it, salvation doesn't only mean receiving life, it actually means termination of the power of sin. So the salvation is termi uh, termination and gem germination. So something is terminated and something else is germinated. The life of God is germinated in us. And what? guess what? The life of the devil or the nature of the devil, the power of the devil, the influence of the devil is terminated. That's why Jesus had to go to the cross to terminate it. But pastor, if you are saying we have been bought, who was the price paid to? Who did he buy us from? We were bought, not the price was not paid to the devil. But the price, because we are indebted to God and the judgment of God, the wrath of God was against us. Watch this. Satan now had an upper hand over our lives. But Jesus paid the price to the justice of God. Justice requires and justice demands that the sinner, the souls that sin must die. The wages of sin is death. So everyone who has sinned must die. So the justice of God requires that God must of a necessity be angry with sin and sinners. The, every sinner incurs the wrath of God. I think let me read this. Psalm, I think in Psalm, Psalm 5 or Psalm 11. Psalm 5 and Psalm 11. Let me just show you something quickly. Verse 6, I think so. Some 5, verse 6. Um, um, okay, it's rather some 6, verse. Um, I didn't tend to. All right, some 5, verse. All right, let me just go to the verse. Some, some 11. Thank you, Jesus. I want to show you something. Some 11. Yes. Verse 5. Okay. Some 11, verse 5 says that the Lord tries the righteous, but the wicked. And him that loves violence, his soul hates. 
the, the soul of God. The Bible says his soul. God hates him that laughs wicked. Or the wicked and him that he, 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 the wicked and him that loves loves violence. God hates. <laughs> so that's why it becomes a problem when we are just going on telling everybody, God loves you, God loves you. Yet the love of God is for all, it's available for all. However, the wrath of God in Romans chapter 1, verse 18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed in heaven. Why are we only talking about it? the love of God? God is a God of love, but it's also a God of wrath, hunger. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against, oh my God. Romans chapter 18, chapter 1 verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. The wrath of God. So to be saved, saved from what? We are saved from uh, four things in two main, main categories. One category, number one, we are saved from God. From the wrath of God. From the punishment or the judgment of God. So Jesus had to come and save us from the wrath of God, according to Romans chapter 1, verse 8. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. But Romans chapter 1, 1 verse 17 says that for the righteousness for where there in talking about the gospel. In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. So we are dealing with the righteousness of God and the wrath of God against the unrighteousness of man. So the righteousness, of, what we need is the righteousness of God. How do we get the righteousness of God? It's faith in Christ Jesus. So that is salvation. Salvation is the righteousness of God has been credited into your account. So that you are moved away from the wrath of God, from, from enmity with God into reconciliation and into the righteousness of God. Hallelujah. And so the wrath of God is revealed. So salvation from the wrath of God. Now, how about the devil? We are not saved from the devil, but we have saved, we are, we are saved from the power of sin. Sin has you. In, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, he says that, for he shall save his people from their sins. So we are saved from our sins. So we are saved from the wrath of God. We are saved too from our sins. In other words, the power of sin. So sin can have dominion over you. Galatians, Romans chapter 6, verse 14. I always quote the scripture. Sin will not have no longer have dominion over you. Sin can rule you. Sin can dictate how your life should come out. Sin is, is has no more no more authority and power over you. So save from the power of sin, not only from the power of sin, but the judgment of sin, because you have sinned. All have sinned. You and I are sinners. That's the biggest problem of humanity. Forget about religion. I'm talking about sin. What are you going to be about, about your sin? There's no religion that guarantees forgiveness of sin. No religion can guarantee you, but faith in Christ Jesus guarantees forgiveness of sins. Hallelujah! Because your sin must be forgiven. Romans, sorry, John chapter 8, verse 20, 24. He said, if you don't believe that I am he, I'm the one, you will die in your sins. The reason why people die in their sins is not because God is angry, not because God is not love, but because they didn't believe. In John chapter 16, verse, I think verse 9, he said, convict the world of sin because they did not believe. So the sin of unbelief is what sends people to hell. Not so much of their works because your works is, is useless, whether good or bad. So nobody is justified or is, receives acceptance with God by their good works because no one can really be good throughout. If you cross all the green lights, go through green, green, and you cross, let's say you are driving and a police officer stops you. And so police officer, you cross red, he stops, stops you. You can't say, oh, sir, uh, officer, I've gone through, oh, oh, it's only green. It's just this time I went through red. One read. It says that if at what at whatever point you break the law, I think in James also, you, you have broken all. If you bro break it at one point, you have broken all. That's interesting. It's just like a woman's pearl, you know, a, a necklace pearl. You break one or the chain, break one, the, all the pearls fall. Because at one point, it doesn't have to break at every point. So you don't have to break all sins. One sin makes you a sinner. <laughs> so some, no one can stand and say, that's for me, I'm so righteous. That's for me, I'm so, uh, my works are so good. God can accept me. God can't accept your good works. Neither will your, your bad works make him accept you. God can't accept the works of men. That's why Jesus asked the, the people who accused the woman who was caught in adultery that he should, she should be stoned. Jesus said, he amongst you who is without sin, John chapter 8, verse 8 and 9. 
if any whoever is among amongst you who is without sin, let him throw the first stone. I keep referring to this scripture because it's amazing. Jesus came to save sinners. All right. So he came to save us from our sins. The sins you have committed, it to send you to hell. Your sins are sending you to hell. Sin sends people to hell. Sin brings people under condemnation. Sin brings people under the wrath of God. Sin brings men, man, under the wrath of God, under condemnation, under eternal judgment. If you make a mistake and you die in your sins, you will burn in hell. <laughs> it's, it's true. If you die in your sins, and the only way you can be forgiven of your sins is Jesus. That's the only way. Jesus said, if you do not believe I am he, you will, John chapter 8 verse 24. If you don't believe I am he, you will die in your sins. I pray you will not die in your sins. You will not die in your sins. But pastor, you don't know what I'm talking about. I've done so many things, so many bad things, and I don't think God can ever forgive me. There is no sin so far that God can't forgive you except the sin of unbelief. What's the unbelief? Not believing in Jesus. That's the only way we can be forgiven of our sins. So we are saved from God, the wrath of God. We are saved from our sin, the power and the penalty of sin. So Satan is using the sin to control you. It's like sin inside you controlling your life. We are saved from the world, the influence of the world. So we are saved from the influence of the world and attachment to the world. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, he says that the whole world lies under the sway of the evil one. Satan is is making manipulating them to do his will but we are saved from the influence of the world hallelujah and attachment to the world james 4 4 friendship with the world is enmity with god to god friendship with the world but we are we have been reconciled so we are no more enemies with god to god hallelujah so saved from god the wrath of god saved from from sin presence and power of sin or power and the penalty of sin and then and i'm a, Three, save from the world. And number four, save, save from the flesh. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me? Romans chapter 7, verse 24. Who will deliver me from this body of death? He said, for I am carnal, sold under sin. Romans chapter 7, verse 14. I am carnal, sold under sin. My body, I'm sold in this body, sold under sin. And verse, verse 24, who will deliver me from this body of death? So Christ came to, so when we talk about salvation, we are talking about salvation from God, the wrath of God, from sin, from the world, and from the flesh. Satan uses the, the, the sin in your life, worldliness, and the flesh to control you. To have, we are not saved from the devil, from Satan. We are saved from the influence of the world. We are saved. Anything he can use, the handle he will use to control you, that's what God saves us from. Hallelujah! And we are delivered from the powers of darkness. So now, we are saved from all this. Saved. Are you saved? How do you know you are saved? The question is, what must I do to be saved? What does it take for a person to be saved? What does it take for true salvation? For a person to receive true salvation? Remember, as I said earlier on, the word of God is the word of life. The word of God is a word of life. In Romans, sorry, in Acts chapter, I think I need to read it. Acts chapter 11, verse, sorry, Acts chapter 4, please pardon me. Acts chapter 4, verse 11, it says that, let's go to verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other. This is serious. Listen to me. This is serious. See, this can be considered politically incorrect <laughs> in this modern day of inclusivism and relativism and rationalism and pluralism and skepticism political incorrect political correctness and tolerance in this modern day of that this 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 the bible is not allowed to say some things watch this um acts 4 12 neither is there salvation in any other what's the meaning of any other it just means what it means. There's no other. Your money can save you. Your contacts can save you. Religious activities and religious rights will save you. The Pope declaring you peace, uh, declare peace so you won't save you. Giving money to a bishop does not save you. Giving money to church will not save you. There's no 
at that name. The word, let me read it again. There's no, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we, might be, we must be saved. There's no other. When he said there's, he didn't say there's no name. He said there's no other. Some religions will tell you that, oh, you can't know whether you are saved or for, your sins are forgiven. Oh boy, I agree with you because you can't know. When you go down that route, there's only one way you can know. And that's when you believe in Jesus Christ. There's no other ways. So how do you get saved? What's the mean? To, what, what must I do to be saved? How can one be saved? How can one be part of the redeemed community? How can one become part of the true church of God? How can one become part of the body of Christ? How can Some people are in church but are not saved. You've been going to church for the past 38 years but you are not saved. Yeah. You can be, going, you can be very engaged in church activity and you are not saved. Because there's only one way to be saved. One, there's no other name given amongst men by which we might be saved. No other name. There's only one name. There's only one way, praise God, to be saved. So let's explore that. What must I do to be saved? Hallelujah. Woo, I love the Lord. In, um, in uh, let's go to Romans chapter 10. In Romans chapter 10, verse 13, watch this. For whoever shall call up or upon the name of the Lord, what happens to you? You shall be saved. <laughs> Hallelujah. For whoever shall call on the name of the Lord. Oh, so how, what must I do to be saved? Call on the name of the Lord. For whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But pastor, I have a problem. Is it not Jesus who said, some people who, he said no, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, not all those who say, Lord, Lord. Yeah, you can say it doesn't mean you are calling on his name. You are saying doesn't mean you are calling. So what does it mean to call? Yeah, that's what we are going to explore. <laughs> what does it mean to be saved? Or what does it take to be saved? Simple, one, call on the name of the Lord. That's all. That's all it takes to be saved. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the scripture. It says, for there's no other name. No other name. You remember the name? Watch this. Let me read it again. Romans chapter 10, verse 13. For whoever shall call upon the name. And he said, there's no other name given amongst men under heaven. by which." So he's talking about name. It takes a name to be saved. Hallelujah! Lord Jesus! It takes a name to be saved. It takes a name to be saved. It doesn't take your name being registered in a church to be saved. Pastor, pastor, please get this. Uh, please, excuse me. Help me out here. So I don't need to go to church. I did, but I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Why would you be saved and not go to church? Why would you be saved and not be part of the, the, the gathering of the brethren? Why would you be saved and not be part of a church? But the starting point is not just registration in a church. The starting point is calling on the name of the Lord. Salvation. How must I be saved? What must I do to be saved? Call on the name of the Lord Jesus. Why? Because there's no other name. If you call any other name, sorry, sorry, me. Sorry, me. If you call any other name, sorry, me. There's no other name given amongst men by which men must be saved. So he says that for whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Then he goes on to say, um, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Oh, hold on, hold on. So you can't call if you haven't believed. So it starts with believing. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes, it starts with believing, should not perish. Everyone is perishing. Everyone is perishing. So the only way a person will not perish is to believe. So he said, how can they call, how shall they call on whom, in whom they have not believed? It's not possible. That's why he said, oh, not all those who say, Lord, Lord. But what does it mean to call on the name? That means that it starts, it, it, it starts with believing. Believing. So in Acts chapter 16, when the man asks the question, when the uh, jailer, Philippian jailer, asks the question, what must a brethren or men says, what must I do to be saved? They answered and said, verse 31, believe. Hallelujah. 
Believe because the only way it takes, the means through which you can be saved is by believing. They asked Jesus in John, I read already earlier on, John chapter 6 verse 20, what must we do to do the works of him, uh, uh, the works of God? What must we do? Jesus said to do the work of God is to believe on him who he has sent. In John chapter 20 verse 30, it says that there are so many things that Jesus did which were not recorded, but these have been recorded that you will believe. Now, this leads me to the question, believe what? Believe that God is good? No, that's not the, that's not the, that's not the point here. How can they call it without believing? No, you're not, it's not that believe, or believe that God is love. It's true, but that's not what saves you. Wow. Believe that um, the, the church is the bride of Christ. Yeah, you believe it, but it doesn't make you saved. Believe that there's heaven and hell. Oh yeah, that's, that's right. Your, your belief is right, but it doesn't save you. That does not save you. There is only one believing that saves. So that, is, that means that when we are talking to people, when God sends us to people to speak to them to be saved, we have to be very careful what we are telling them. Believe that God is good. Believe that God can heal you. Believe that God can change your story. All those things are good, but they are not salvific. They don't have saving influence and saving abilities. So we have to be specific about what believe. Somebody say, I believe. What if you believe? What do you believe? What you believe it is, is what determines whether you are saved or not. Oh, I believe there's one God. That's, that is not salvific. You believe there's one God. Does not mean you are saved. Oh, I believe God is good. I believe there is a paradise. When I die and I've done good, I believe in being good. I believe in being kind. I be, now you are beginning to go into works. Works don't save. It's belief that save. But it's not every belief that saves. There's a particular belief. So he says that Jesus did so many things, so many things where, which are not recorded. These are record, have been recorded that you believe. Believe what? Believe in Christ. What are, you, what are you going to believe in Christ? That he lived once upon a time. Yes, but that's not the whole story. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let me go back again. John chapter 20, verse 30, 31. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That is what you must believe. I uh, believe in that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the, the Savior. And he's the Son of God means that the only one who came from God. John chapter 1, verse 18, he said, No one has seen the Father at any time, but him who came from the bosom. In other words, he was so much part of God and he came out of God or he came of God. He's of God. He who came, who came from the bosom of the Father, he has declared God to us. He has defined God to us. He has revealed God to us. He has manifested God to us. He has demonstrated God to us. He came so we can see how God is, how God looks like if he was in the flesh. He came so we can, so his Bible says, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3, he is the express image of the Father, of the glory of God. He is the express image, like God's thumbprint, you just see exactly what, we were created in the image of God, but sin distorted the image, and Christ came to be, to be an exact image of God, so that those who believe in him, Bible says that those he foreknew, he also predestined, Romans chapter 8 verse 29, those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image, watch this, image, Jesus is the image of God, and now we are also predestined to be conformed into the image, to be conformed into the image of Christ, that he might be the firstborn amongst many brethren. So now what happens that he being the express image of God, oh my God, by God, thank you, Jesus. He being the express image of God, and we are in his image, invariably we are now also in the image of God. So when you are born again, heaven looks down from and is seeing the image of God in you. Why? Because he's seen a Christ in you, Christ in her, Christ, and that is what is called the church, the church. The church, as I keep saying, is Christ in you, Christ. So you can't say you are in, in, in the church. You are part of the church. You might be part of a church, but you are not part of the church. The only way to be part of the church is to be saved. And the only way to be saved is to believe in him, to receive the life. Once you receive the life, automatically you have also been baptized by the Spirit into one body according to uh, uh, Corinthians chapter 4 verse 13, I think first, uh, first Corinthians so. You are baptized into one body. By him we are baptized baptized into one body as by the spirit by one spirit as soon as you believe already you are part of it you are initiated hallelujah then you begin to live the church life or the christian life or the spiritual life or the kingdom life hallelujah praise god so 
Back to the point I'm making. It says that how Romans chapter 10 verse. Thank you, Lord. Verse 13. Sorry, verse 14. How shall they call on him on whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? So, your believing is a function of your hearing. That's getting interesting now. What must I do to be saved? How can I be saved? What's the process of salvation? Somebody must must hear. You must hear something. What must you hear? You must hear the word of God. The word is called the word of life. So in, in the book of Acts, um, chapter, I think, let me, I'm thinking which one to consider now. All right, let's go to Acts chapter 11. I think I'll go to Acts chapter 11 and pick it from there. Acts chapter 11, verse, 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 verse 13 and 14. This is Cornelius. When he is the, a, an angel of God appeared to him and the angel says, and and he showed, he showed us how, that's Peter reporting Cornelius' story, how he had seen an angel in his house which stood and said to him, send men to Joppa and call for Simon, Simon, whose surname is Peter. Verse 14, who shall tell thee words? What shall he do? He's supposed to, the preacher is supposed to come and tell you words. We shall tell you words by which thou and all thy house shall be saved. It takes words from a preacher. <laughs> When Paul, Saul of Tarsus, when he met Jesus, he said, what do you want me to do? He said, go to the city. They will tell you what to do. Because angels don't preach the gospel. An angel came. He said, go and call it Peter. And not any human being who knows Bible stories. Not a theologian. The fact that you know theological, you are theologically, uh, you have PhD in theology, does not mean you are a Christian, excuse me. The fact that you actually believe in the Bible, that the Bible is true, is true, doesn't mean you are a Christian. You have to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ that he saved and commit your life to it and bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. That means you have changed. He called, came to call sinners to repentance. Hallelujah. And so he said, go and call Peter so he can tell you the ways of life by which you might be saved. So it takes some words, certain type of words for us to be saved. The words of life, the word of life, the word of life, the word of life. In Acts chapter 5 verse 20. Acts chapter 5, verse 20, the angel told him after he brought him out of prison, Peter, he said, go, stand and speak in the temple to the, to, to the people all the words of this life. The words of this life. Go and preach. Go and speak the words of this life. And once the word of this life is preached, people get saved. Bible talks about how um, the church in Samaria, Acts chapter 8, verse 4. 14, when the church of Jerusalem, the elders in Jerusalem, when Jerusalem, they heard that Samaria has received the word. They sent Peter and John. They have received the word. That's what it means to be saved. You have received that word of salvation. The word. How can they believe? So you believe the word, that means you have received the word. It's, so it, if he's believing in Christ Jesus, then the word must be telling us Christ Jesus, not must be telling us stories and issues of life. And pers- personal testimonies are good. Those are the fruits of salvation. When the life I'm talking about, you see, let me put it this way. When you are saved, it means you have received the life, eternal life. You have received everlasting life. You have the life. How? So, the, but it's the word that brings the life. So the word is like the seed of the life. So in Mark chapter 4, verse 14, Mark 4, 14, it talks about how the word of God is the seed. The word is the seed. It's a seed. It's a seed of life. When it's sown by the preacher and you receive it, it you believe it and receive it, it now enters your life and germinates the life of God in you. And that is what means you are saved. You have the life of God. You have the Zoe of God. Hallelujah. And so he said, go and speak to them these words of life. And the words that bring life are particular words. It's not anything at all, any preacher. Some, you can be a preacher and still not preach the word of life. You preach, the fact that you are preaching doesn't mean people are being saved. The fact that you are preaching, it's not every preaching that brings salvation. That's very important. It's not every preaching that brings salvation. And watch this. It is not the intelligibility or intellectualism or the eloquence of the preaching that saves. So some people have convincing or, or, oratorial, or, oratorial, oratory, oratory, oratorial skills. 
They are elocutionists. When they speak, some people are just like, they have ability to argue their case out and convince you. You can convince a person, but doesn't mean the Holy Ghost has convicted them. So the fact that you are saying something to somebody and you have convinced the person doesn't mean the person is saved. He didn't say, go and preach about miracles. Miracles are important. Please don't let us. Hey, very important. I believe in miracles. In fact, may God give you a testimony and a miracle in the name of Jesus. But that's not what gets people saved because Jesus multiplied bread. They ate it. Did one of the radical miracles. They ate it and they turned their back and they were, they were not saved. Why? Because they didn't receive the word. And so the, it is the, the word that is preached. Samaria received the word. Bible talks about how, I like this, uh, in John, sorry, in Acts chapter 6, verse 7, Bible says the word of God grew. In, jo- in Acts chapter 12, verse 24, the word of God grew and multiplied. In Acts chapter um chapter 19 verse 20 so mightily grew the word and prevailed the word of god grew and prevailed so the word grows that is why um, in Acts chapter 19 verse 10 bible says that the whole of asia heard the word acts 19 10 the whole of asia heard the word in acts acts chapter um, 13 verse 40 44 says that the next day the next sabbath all the whole of the city came to hear the word not to come and see uh, things that make them laugh. Pastors, our job is to make, not make you laugh. Our job is to preach the word. Christians, when we go, when you are talking, the word, you must, we must be filled with the word. Now watch this. I, I, I believe something. The fact that a church is increasing in number doesn't mean the church is growing. Because until the word of God grows, the, peop- the church is not growing. And Bible says that, and the Lord added to the church. The word of God grew. I think I should read it in Acts. I'm already in Acts. In Acts chapter 12, verse 24. Acts chapter 12, verse 24. Thank you, Jesus. But the word of God grew and multiplied. In Acts chapter um, 6, verse 7. Is it to remember? Who, when they have sent for a, whom they set for, for, uh, no, no, verse 7 and the word of God increased and the number of disciples multiplied greatly why the word of the Lord increased because of that the number of the disciples multiplied if we can allow the word of God to increase the disciples will actually multiply proper disciples and proper people who are saved because it takes the word to be saved the word must increase the word must spread everywhere in fact it says that for I am not ashamed Romans chapter Romans chapter 1 verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. It takes the word for people to be saved. Hallelujah. Man, man, Matthew chapter 4 verse 4, man must not live by bread alone, live life. See, what brings life? Man must not live and sustain, brings and sustains life. Man must not live by bread alone. That's for your physical existence. But by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord, that word is what brings life and sustains life. So in church, those of us who are saved, we also have to regularly be exposed to hearing the word, reading the word, enjoying the word, receiving the word. That is what sustains life and grows life. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now let's, let's let me, I will, let me just begin to round up and take you to what must I do to be saved? How shall they be, call on him on whom they have not believed? And then he goes on. I think let me just round up there. Let me just mention that and I will leave. And then how the, 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 Romans chapter 10 verse 14. How shall they call on him on whom they have not believed? Uh, they have not uh, have not believed. And how shall they believe on him they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they hear? That's why I said, send for Peter to come and preach to you. It takes a preacher to be saved, not signs and wonders. It says a preacher who will, be, who will preach the word of truth. The word of truth. Before I even go, let's look at Ephesians. Let me show you something. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13. Ephesians 1 13 and then John chapter 5. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 says that, in whom ye also trusted after ye have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation. It's the gospel of your salvation. You hear, it's the word of truth. You hear it to be saved. You hear it to be saved. You hear a particular gospel, a particular type of preaching to be saved and to stay safe. To be saved doesn't mean you are safe. So you have to be saved and stay safe. Stay safe by keeping hearing 
the same message, the message, the gospel, the, the word of God, the word of truth. It takes the word of truth for us to be saved and for us to stay safe. John chapter 5 verse 24. I read it earlier on, but let me read it now. John chapter 5 verse 24. It says in my Bible that verily, verily, I say unto you, he who hears my word, and believe on him that sent me, has everlasting life, she had mentioned it, that's saved, and shall not come into condemnation, but pass from death to life. Hear my words. So the word of your, the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, it takes the gospel, it takes the preaching of the word. I said it takes the preaching of the word. Look at Luke chapter 16. When we go to Luke chapter 16, this is a nice one, you will like this. This is talking about Lazarus and the rich man. And Jesus told this story about one rich man, Lazarus, and they both died, and they both um, they were, both went to Hades, underworld. Jesus, uh, Lazarus went to Abraham's bosom, which was a rabbinical phrase for paradise. He went to um, Abraham's bosom. Jesus, remember, Jesus said, today you shall be with me in paradise. So when good people die, or righteous people die, the godly people die, they go to paradise. And then the other one, the rich man went to hell where he was tormented. And then in hell, he lifted his eyes and spoke to Abraham. And it, so they can, it's, it's like you can talk to, they can talk to one another in Hades. But let's leave that. And he says that, um, verse 29 said, Abraham, sorry, <laughs> he called and said, um, uh, verse 27 said, he said, I pray thee, Father, that thou would, that would send him to my father's house. Send somebody from the grave. Send Lazarus to go to my father. They will believe it. Send him to my father's house. Um, send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Is it possible there's somebody in hell right now or somebody in the place of torture who is trying to send a message to somebody who is alive that bro, please change. Listen. Listen to the preaching. Believe in Christ and repent and be saved. Don't come here. Don't come here, please. Is there a message coming from there? Potentially. He says, send someone to go and tell them. Let's hear what Father Abraham said, Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. He said, they have Moses and the prophets. They don't need miracles. They don't need something spooky. They don't, people who are waiting for God, if you are really God, for me to believe, show me this, please forget it. God is not in the business of doing those things. If it takes believing of the word to be saved, not believing of manifestations and signs to be saved. Those things might be necessary after what the word of God is preached. So the, the, the miracles, signs, and wonders will back the word. Acts chapter 16, 20, sorry, Mark chapter 16, 20 said they went preaching, God backing his word with signs, wonders, and miracles. So it backs the word, but it takes the word to be saved, not miracles or signs for people to be saved. So watch this. It says that um, they have Moses and the prophets. What does it mean to have Moses and the prophets? What to have Moses and the prophet in, 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 in Luke chapter, um, I'm already in Luke here. Yeah? So Luke chapter 24, verse 27, the Bible talks about how Jesus Christ, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them all, all the scriptures that, uh, all the, in, in all the scriptures, the things concerning him, from Moses and the prophets. Jesus, the Bible said, Jesus, from Moses and the prophet, expounded to them all that is written concerning him. John chapter 5, verse 44. John chapter 5, verse 45 and 47. He says that to 47, he said, do you think that I, do you think that I will accuse you to the father? There is one that accused you, even Moses, in whom you trust. For he, uh, for he, uh, for, sorry, for had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote about me. So everything the prophets and Moses Sometimes Moses represented by the law. Everything the prophets and Moses said was about Jesus. Verse 27. But if ye believe not the writings, uh, not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? So, in other words, he said they have Moses and the prophets. But Abraham said they have Moses of the prophets. What does what was he referring to? They have the word of God. God, that's all it takes to be saved. Jesus said, if you believe it, you believe in me. If you believe in the word, the word does not I need other things. If other things, if the word can't change you, other things can't change you. The word is the most potent thing that can change lives, that can save life. Hallelujah. And in, in the book of Acts chapter, um, let me just, Acts, let's go to Acts quickly. Acts chapter 15 verse 21, and then Acts chapter 16 verse 22, and Acts chapter 28 verse 23. 
Acts chapter 15, 21. Acts 15, 21, um, it says that, For Moses of old time has, has in every city them that preach him, being read in the synagogues every, every Sabbath day. So when he say Moses, he's talking about the message, the word of God. All right, look at Acts chapter 16, verse 22. Um, Paul talking about having obtained help from God unto this day. And Acts 16, so uh, it's not 16, I'm sorry, 26, please pardon me. Acts 26, 22. Acts 26, 22 says that, Having therefore obtained help from God, I continue to this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying no other thing than that which the prophets and Moses did say should come. Then he went on to say that Christ should suffer. So they preached Christ should suffer. And that's what Moses, anything you claim is in the Bible, that doesn't point to the suffering of Christ. All the Old Testament were pointing the suffering of Christ, the Christ, Christ, the point is that Jesus said, Moses spoke about me. If you believe in Moses, you believe in me. So uh, the, the Father Abraham said, let them hear Moses. If they don't hear Moses, they will not believe me. And then the guy said, no, 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 no. If someone really comes from the grave, <laughs> I think I'll leave the rest because of my time. I think Acts, since I'm already in Acts chapter 28, verse 23, says that, and when they had appointed him a day, they came, uh, there came many unto him in the lodge, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus. Did you see that? His message was Jesus, both out of the law and Moses and all and out of the prophets from morning till evening. That's what he was doing, talking about Jesus, proving from the law and the prophets all day, Paul, when they came, all day, he was, he was trying to prove something to them from the law and the prophets that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Jesus Christ is the Messiah and that he suffered. And um, so back to Luke chapter 16, he says that, and the, the, the rich man said to Father Abraham, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went out from the dead, they will repent. And the, Father Abraham said, and he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophet, neither will they be persuaded, though someone rose from the dead. So someone rising from the dead, that's why Jesus had to rise from the dead to make a statement. And strange miracles won't change people if the word of God can change you. So when people say, okay, you want, I want, you want me to believe, God should prove himself. He won't prove himself. Believe in the word. That's the only way the word of God is. Salvation is, is attained and is achieved. How can they call on him whom they have not believed? How can they believe and believe in him who, of whom they have not heard? How can they hear without a preacher? Finally, let me add, what do we preach in Acts chapter, um, as I showed you, we said, I was preaching nothing but Christ and crucified. That from the Moses, I would prove him from the Moses that is about Christ and him crucified. The message is about Christ. For there is no, Acts chapter 4, verse 11, for there is no other name given um, 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 amongst men under heaven by which men must be saved. It takes the name of Jesus. For whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So let's look at this. When you preach the word, don't let us be worried because of rejection, because some will reject. In Acts chapter 13, the Bible says that, I think I should go to that. Acts chapter 13, I'm running up now. Acts chapter 13, verse, this is good, from verse 44. And the next Sabbath, the next Sabbath, they came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. I like it that when people are coming to church, not because of music. When people are coming to church, not just because their friends are there. You may, your friend might invite you in because they are there. But it gets to a time where because the word is there, you are coming for the word. You are coming. That's why this lockdown, if a church is built around the word, it won't shake them because the members, genuine Christians have a desire for the word of God. Let's focus on the word. He said the whole city came to hear the word of God. Hallelujah. The whole city came to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitude, they were filled with envy and spoke against, against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Because they knew it was the word of God. But they said, a jealousy made them say the things they were saying. Verse 46, then Paul and Barnabas waxed, waxed bold and said, it is necessary that the word of God be, uh, should be first spoken to you. But since ye... Uh, 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 to, uh, to you, but since ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentile. So if you reject the word, you have judged yourself unworthy of everlasting life. 
because it's the word that breaks everlasting life. You reject it, you have rejected everlasting life. Some will always reject the word. And when the Gentiles heard this, this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And many as were ordained to eternal life believed. As many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Church, don't let us be worried about those who are not believing so that we can try and go into bed with the world. Or we are trying to win the world. The world, or we know the world must feel nice about us. Don't let, don't let us abandon or compromise our message so that we can be appealing to the world. If we preach the word, and as we preach the word, those who are saved will be saved. The Bible says some will always not believe. In Acts chapter 14, verse 4, some did not believe. In Acts chapter 17, verse 4, some did not believe. It's always like that. Acts chapter 20, 20 uh, 12, I think, uh, the, the, some will not believe. And uh, Acts chapter 28, verse 24, after ex- the whole all day explaining about Jesus, some did not believe, but some believed. Some did not believe. It's always like that in Acts chapter 19 from verse 6. Some did not believe and actually spoke evil of the way. Verse 9. They did not they spoke evil of the way. So some would not believe. So let's not be distracted by the some who will not believe. And usually the some who don't believe can be even many. But let's not be distracted and let's stay focused on the word because those who are ordained and appointed unto eternal life will believe. How did you end up believing? It's not because the, the preacher was so convincing, but it's because the word of God found a place in your heart. You received the word and believe. Don't let us, in 1 Corinthians, that's, I think that, that's the last two scriptures I'll quote. 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter, chapter 1, verse 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. Um, I hope someone is learning something. First Corinthians 1, it is said, for the preaching of the, of the cross, see, that's what we preach. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to, to us who are saved, it is the power of God. What saves? The word. And what kind of word? The preaching of the cross. We preach the cross, not preaching of the love of God, not preaching of the goodness of God, not preaching of testimony, other people's testimony, not preaching. All those things are good. They are side effects. They are good. But the main thing that says is the preaching of the cross. Cross. Why cross? Because Christ died for our sins so that we don't have to die in our sins. Christ died. That's the meaning of the cross. The preaching of the cross is foolishness. The thing that saves is foolishness to those who are perishing. Look at verse 23. Verse 23 says that, but we preach Christ we preach Christ crucified. We preach Christ crucified. They don't like it, but we preach Christ crucified. It may not be appealing, but we preach Christ crucified. It may be old-fashioned, old cross. We don't need a new cross. We don't need a new cross. The old cross still saves. Hallelujah! The old cross still saves. We don't need new cross. The old cross still, still saves. The old ragged cross still saves. We, they, we preach, it says that, we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the, to the Greeks' foolishness. Why are you preaching what is foolishness? That is the nature of the message that saves. Why are you preaching what is a stumbling block? Other people will even make them make mistakes. That's the message that must preach. Because no, that's not politically correct. Because you make somebody stumble, you are offend somebody. You do we don't intend to. But the message itself, the heart of a sinner will be offended in the genuine message that saves. But look at it, verse 24. 24 says, But unto them that are called, both Jews and Greeks, those who are being offended, there are some among them who will not be offended. There are some among them, those who will stumble. There are some who will not stumble, but they will believe. So, but but we preach Christ crucified on verse 24. But unto them that are called both Jews and Greeks Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God hallelujah (laughs) hallelujah we preach Christ him crucified the Jews a stumbling block the Greeks foolishness but to those who are saved both Jews and Greek it's Christ is the wisdom of God and the power of God what must I do to be saved call on the name of the Lord can I call? You have to believe. How can I believe? You have to hear. What must I hear? You have to hear the word of grace, the word of truth, the gospel of salvation, which is Christ crucified, Christ resurrected, and Christ our Savior. Hallelujah. We thank God for using his servant, Reverend Dr. David Entry, to share this awesome word. If this message has blessed you in any way, please spread the word by sharing it and send us an email to amen at charis.org. Remember to stay connected with us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube and Twitter for regular updates on what God is doing here at Caris Ministries. Stay blessed.